welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. We are so excited that you are joining us for the show today. This podcast aims to explore a biblical life view in a conversational tone. Let's join our host and founder of Servants of Grace, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me, I have Doctor Beaky. Doctor Beaky, welcome to the Equipping You. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, sir. Uh, good to be with you, David. Uh, can you uh, please catch us up, up on what's going on in your life, marriage, ministry, and what do you have going on ministry project wise? Well, my my marriage is is I still have the best woman in the world. <laughs> She's great. Um, all of our children are now married, which is something new. Our last child got married a few months ago, and so we are now empty nesters. So my wife gets to travel with me all the time, which is a huge plus. And we're expecting our fourth grandchild in a few few weeks, so there's uh, quite a bit going on in the home front there. Uh, in terms of ministry, uh, we're we're calling a pastor at the present time, but uh, we're, we're because our uh, one of our, our senior pastor or our full time pastor rather left for Ontario, a call to Ontario, so that. At present, I'm, I'm doing a lot in the church, which is kind of overwhelming me, but I love it. But uh, hopefully it'll be just short term. And in terms of uh, seminary, things are going extremely well in terms of the number of students and applications and uh, possibilities. We, we now have more than 200 students at Puritan Reformed in program, various programs. And the PhD is, was established, approved by ATS a few years ago. It's going well. In terms of my book ministry, Reformation Heritage Books, that's also uh, a going going extremely well. Right now, my major project in working is working on it, my systematic theology together with my TA. We're going to co-author that and Crossway will publish it. The first volume is done. It's going to be four volumes, about 5,000 pages. And the first volume is, uh, has been edited. It's back with Crossway now and will come out in March, the Lord willing, of next year. So that will be my major writing project for the next four or five years. As um, you may know, I feel closest to God usually when I write, and so writing is very important to me, and to leave a legacy behind of 30-some years of teaching systematics is um, it's just a very exciting, humbling thing for me, and I pray that you will pray with me that God will spare both my TA and myself for this co-authored a Reformed Systematic Theology that will be coming out, hopefully one volume per year, starting next year. So, I'll, I'll be talking to you quite often then. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine with me, sir. I, I love talking to you. Love reading what you put out. So thank you. Uh, and and uh, can you please tell us about your book, Reformed Preaching, Proclaiming God's Word from the Heart of the Preacher to the Heart of His People, why you wrote it, and how you hope it's received? Yes. Uh, Reform Preaching has been just published by Crossway uh, last week. I think the official date of release is set for this this week, October 31. But um, it's, a, it's a book I've wanted to write all my life. I've often said to people throughout my life that there's one book I absolutely must write before I pass away, and it's, it's this book. I, I waited until I was 65 years old to, uh, to publish it. I just felt like to do it earlier in my life would not have given it enough uh, uh, enough gravitas. At the same time, I felt that someone else maybe could do it better than me, and I was waiting for someone to do it. Basically, it's a book that just hones in on one aspect of preaching. Uh, all preaching, of course, must be biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical. And this book just looks at what is Reformed experiential preaching. The amazing thing, David, is that no one has ever done in any language a book on this subject. There's a few chapters in various books. Uh, Charles Bridges has a chap two chapters in his Christian ministry, which are excellent. But what I try to do in this book is I look at three things. First, I have the first third of the book looks at what is experiential preaching. And I explain that in terms of how things ought to go in the Christian life, how they do go, and what is the end goal of the Christian life, and that ministers must preach, preach those things. The ought to, the ideal of the Christian life, Romans 8, the real, the realism of the Christian life, 
and the struggles, Romans 7, and the end goal of being with Christ forever in glory, Revelation 21, 22, uh, if you will. So that's the first part of the book. I give different marks of experiential preaching. I try to look at uh, the experiential preacher himself, what kind of a man he will be. And then the second part, and the largest part of the book, I begin with the first Reformed preacher, Zwingli, and look at 24 different exper- Reformed experiential preachers, running from Zwingli all the way to Martin Lloyd-Jones, and just look at different aspects of how they spoke to the experience of God's people. Hence the subtitle that Crossway gave the book, uh, Proclaiming God's Word from the Heart of the Preacher to the Heart of His People. Then the third part of the book, final part, looks at how do we cross the bridge from those generations, those centuries, to today, and preach experientially today. In other words, how should we apply God's Word to the hearts and lives of our hearers today? That's the applicatory dimension of experiential preaching, and how should we help them examine their own spiritual state and condition before God? And that's the discriminatory element of preaching that belongs to experiential preaching. So in this final part, I am speaking about how experiential preaching begins, first of all, within the preacher himself and his own relationship with God, and then look at how to preach about God, man, Christ, faith, the gospel, and holiness. Those are the six things I look at. Could be many more, of course. How do you do the, how do you preach these things experientially? to the the whole person. And so for me, this is um, a very, very important book. I think it's the most important book I've ever written in my life. I'm very excited about it, see what the Lord will do with it. But I'm also humbled uh, at the privilege of of bringing out this book to uh, churches and pastors, uh, hopefully around the world, and hopefully in many different languages. It's already been an interest expressed in several different languages to translate this book. Well, praise God. We'll we'll definitely be praying that uh, the Lord uses it powerfully and uh, what would you say are a few of the major elements of Reformed experiential preaching? Yes, well, one... I, I would divide experiential preaching, the trunk of it, into two major branches, and I just mentioned them both. One is discriminatory preaching. That's a pretty fat branch. That branch could then subdivide into three other branches. One is that when you preach to your church, you, you distinguish, don't you, between the church and the world, between believers and unbelievers. Then secondly, discriminatory preaching also involves making a separation within the church itself, within the church itself. Itself, you'll have some who are hypocrites who really aren't believers and some who are just seriously backsliding so they're acting like they're not believers. Of course, you'll have unconverted children and other teens and, 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 and adults as well. So within the church. And then thirdly, which seldom is done today compared to how much our forefathers did it, you also have comments in certain sermons, depending on your text, that differentiate among the children of God themselves. In other words, sometimes you might speak to beginners in grace, or as John puts it, other times to young men in grace, other times to the spiritually mature in grace. So that discriminatory element is is an important, important factor of experiential preaching. And then the other bigger and fatter branch would be uh, applicatory preaching, where you apply the word to people's spiritual lives, to their families, to their businesses, to everything that they engage in. If I could if I could indulge uh, a moment, I, I, I have a page in front of me here of a really good definition of experiential preaching from a Baptist writer of the 19th century. Could, could I just read that a moment? Yes, please. Help yourself, sir. Please. Okay, okay. It's a man named... Francis Whelan, he's a, a Baptist preacher, and he was bemoaning the fact that in the middle 19th century, uh, some of the preachers were no longer preaching experientially. You probably know that in America, from the beginning all the way to the 1830s or so, with the, with the, with, with the advent of Charles Finney and his uh, easy believism, uh, almost all the preachers, all the Protestant preachers in our country were experiential. So here's what Whelan writes, and as I read this list of things, just think to yourself, about how often you hear these things from the pulpit today. He says, from the manner in which our ministers entered upon their work, it's evident that it must have been the prominent object of their lives to convert men to God. They were remarkable for what was called experimental preaching. They told much of the exercises of the human soul under the influence of the truth of the gospel, and then 
comes this whole list of things. The feeling of a sinner while under the convicting power of the truth, the various subterfuges to which he resorted when aware of his danger, the successive applications of truth by which he was driven out of all of them, despair of the soul when it found itself holy without a refuge, its final submission to God and simple reliance on Christ, the joys of the new birth and the earnestness of the soul to introduce others to the happiness which it is now for the first time experienced, the trials of the soul when it found itself an object of reproach and persecution among those whom it loved best, the whole process of sanctification, the devices of Satan to lead us into sin, the mode in which the attacks of the adversary may be resisted, the dangers of backsliding with its evidences, and the means of recovery from it. These remarks show the tendency of the class of preachers which seems now to be passing away. Mm, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think that one of the lar- biggest issues in preaching today, you know, there's a lot of conversation about application, and I think probably one of the most significant contributions this book makes, in my estimation, um, other people could disagree, of course, is in the place of application. And you, you've already kind of touched on that, preaching to um, to young people in grace and those who are seasoned. Um, could you just maybe speak to that? How would they, how would pastors do that and teachers of the word do that well? Yeah, well, to, to um, season in grace, of course, you want to mature them in Christ and, and have them see more and more in Christ and your uh, calling on them to use that seasoning and grace very fruitfully in the lives of others. We would encourage them to, um, to evangelize others. They have the ability to do it. They're mature. They have biblical insights and so on. To the young ones in grace, um, I think you need, to, you need to continue to show them their depravity so that they realize that they, they're still sinners, but they're saved by grace. And you need to keep them humble because it's very easy for a young convert to become proud and to be proud of his conversion and his excitement and uh, to, to say things that are ill-advised to those who have more grace and recognize the, the remaining power of indwelling sin and that type of thing. To young men in grace, you try to disciple them more. You try to um, lead them to see more in the scriptures, try to impress upon them the need that Christ might increase and self might decrease, and that they would be useful in in the service of God, and, and not not to creep back to the world and backslide, but use all that energy that they have as a as a growing convert for the good things of God. I mean, that's just those are just a few thoughts that come to mind. I've, I've dealt with it more specifically in the book, of course. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, that's definitely very helpful. How do how do we how do preachers and teachers of the word how do they begin to preach the gospel to the heart of their hearers? Yes. Well, what you, First of all, all experiential preaching has to flow from the particular text that you're expounding. So it's one thing to just give a doctrine and to state it. It's another thing to state how a child of God experiences that doctrine. And once you do that, you're not ending an experience itself when you preach rightly experiential preaching, but you're tracing out the work of the Spirit in the soul, as Jed Packer once said, the Puritans did, so that you can give all glory to God. But you're also, at the same time, resonating with the souls of God's people. The best way I can explain your 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 very, very important question you just asked me is to give you an example. I'm just going to do this off the top of my head, and um, you tell me if you hear the difference. Okay, I'm preacher A, and I'm preaching about the doctrine of the intercession of Christ. And I say, congregation, this is a very comforting doctrine, because Christ is at the right hand of the Father, interceding continually for us, as Hebrews 7 said. And he intercedes for us, continually Continually, uh, clearly, persuasively, and faithfully, so that our future is secure. Mm. Now, that's that's okay. That speaks a bit to the heart. Nothing wrong with that. That can edify people. But now, let me let me preach it another way. This is preacher B. Congregation, the intercession of Christ is one of the most undermined doctrines in all of Reformed theology today, and seldom is its preciousness realized for the soul of the believer. And if you know in your own soul what it means to come to an end of your own ability to pray, and you're in great need and great strife, and you can, you can barely cry out the name Lord to the Lord, and you just are so overwhelmed with affliction and trials and sorrows. What a blessing to have a place to go to where, where there's a mediator at the right hand of the Father who is always, moment by moment, every tick of the clock, interceding for you, for you in the midst of all your needs, as if you were his only child, even though he, he can meet the needs of myriads, of millions of his people at one moment. Just glean and drink in this comfort for your own soul. He is always there. He never 
never forget you for one second. What a comfort in the midst of your greatest needs and your greatest sorrows and, and your fears of backsliding and your battles with indwelling sin. He ever lived to make continual intercession for me. What a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You hear the difference? Yeah. I kind of like the first one a little bit, though, too, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, the, the, you start off a little critical on the on the second one, but that's just maybe that's yeah. me. Yeah, but I like the I well, like the second one too. So objective, objective preaching is fine, but it's got to be mixed with subjective reality mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. So similar similar question: uh, How do pastors and teachers of the word preach for holiness? Yes. Well, there are several things to remember when it comes to preaching for holiness, and I, I believe I devoted a whole a whole chapter to that in the in the book. Book. But um, first of all, we need to understand that all holiness is grounded in our union with Christ. So that must be preached, and that must be preached in a comforting way so that believers understand that it's not their own efforts, uh, devoid of the Spirit of God and devoid of union with Christ, that, that produces holiness. But it's only as they're united with Christ and as the Spirit uh, co-labors in them is holiness uh, produced. And so we preach about the Spirit's power in producing holiness. We preach about union with Christ, but we also preach about spiritual warfare as the way of holiness. God God knows how to strip his people down of all their own righteousness. God knows how to bring us into strife over indwelling sin. And in this way, um, we, through afflictions and through spiritual conflict, we actually learn to do battle against our enemies and grow in holiness. And then, too, the preacher must preach the moral law as, a, as the rule of holiness, so, and the third use of the law, so that we, we understand that the law is more than just a bare bones, thou shalt not, but it, it, the spirituality of the law demands loving God above all, loving my neighbors myself, and that then becomes um, fodder for preaching. Uh, like Calvin said, we are we tend to be we tend to be stubborn donkeys even after we've been born again. Tend to become spiritually uh, lazy, and we need to be goaded by the law to walk in the path of holiness. And then we need to preach the love, the love of God, and the love to others as the soul of holiness. Holiness is marinated in in love. And then too, um, I talk in the book about preaching affliction as the training camp of holiness. God uses affliction to mature and to sanctify his people. And also, we need to preach more about heaven than we're prone to do today as, as the aspiration of holiness, that really, without without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So we, we aim we aim for holiness by seeking to prepare our people for, for glory. And then also, we need to remember, in all preaching for holiness, we preach as sinful men, and so we must we must strive as preachers, humbly, to be men of holiness ourselves. Yeah, I, I just love the some of the most convicting parts of this book is is when you're talking about the character of the preacher and how he's uh, you talk about the vital you know you go through the whole talking about holiness that whole chapter is just so convicting i mean talking about the vital uh union that we have with christ and how we're supposed to commune with him and um not that the whole the whole book is very convicting, but uh, and very very helpful. But that 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 in particular, I think is is uh, well that whole subject is as you know, sir, very neglected in the church today. So I just I right. just think that is just so uh, that particular part of the book and the application section is just so needed. And um, so thank you so much for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. By the way, our your your listener can. Um, we we're having for the first couple of months. We're having a sale uh, because we really want to get this book out. It's a forty dollar book from Crossway, and we're able to offer it a fifty percent discount, which is beyond our normal uh, nonprofit discount price for twenty dollars. And if people would buy them for their pastor and for other teachers in the church, as well as for other lay people, because lay people also that's a strong point I try to make in the book. Lay people need to be aware of what good preaching is as well. Uh, so we're offering three copies for $50 if people want to uh, buy three of them. They make great gifts I would trust for, for, for your for your godly-minded friends uh, for the end of the year, and you can get them then at 60% off, uh, three three copies for $50, by, uh, by, by just sending your order to heritagebooks.org. Oh, wonderful. I'll definitely put that in the show notes and let my friends know. I've, I've had multiple friends um, already buy your book through... Uh, 
uh, WTS books. They had it fifty uh, percent off, so I will be telling other people about that as well. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Definitely, definitely letting them know to, to pick up this book, get it for their pastor, get it for themselves, get it for a friend, and then go get it for another person and on and on. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. So, um, just as we wrap up this conversation here, um, what are what are a few of the biggest takeaways that you want people to take away as they pick up this book? Yeah, one is I think that what I'm trying to do in this book, of course, is what the Puritans were trying to do to to raise the level of holiness in the churches, and that God's churches would be more healthy, more holy, uh, more like Christ. From from reading this book, I also want to impact, of course, ministers directly that. It's a general rule. Now, there are many good ministers today, and there's an increasing number of them, so I'm grateful for that. But as a general rule, I don't think that ministers labor sufficiently hard in their applications, in their discriminatory element of their sermons. I think ministers need to do this on their knees before God when they're preparing their sermons, cry out to God for applications that resonate with the people of God. And my goal is that ministers may mature through reading this book and that they in turn may be used to mature their people. But also that uh, those who are making a false profession, that Christ is just lightly and easily embraced where the fruits do not show that people really are in Christ, that those people will be exposed uh, under experiential preaching, see what they're missing, may learn to cry for mercy and be genuinely saved. I, I really believe that under a lot of preaching in America today and around the world, people that are still dead in their sins are being lulled to sleep thinking and believing themselves that they're believers because they've accepted Jesus lightly and easily on one occasion, uh, either by raising their hand or coming forward or doing something, but their lives don't show the fruit. And I think under a searching experiential ministry, these things are more prone to come to light uh, for the good of those people as well, so they don't deceive themselves for a never-ending eternity. Amen. Well, we'll we'll definitely pray to that answer and trust the the Lord by the Spirit to do just that, to open people's eyes that they might be saved and to equip the saints to preach the word. So I can t- Thank you so much. I can t- Thank you so much. Yes, sir. I continue to just, uh, one last thing, I just continue to be blessed by your ministry and uh, so many people are and help. So please be encouraged by that and give thanks to God. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Praise God for any, any influence for good. That's Thank you. Yes, sir. We will talk to you next time, and just thank you for your time today, sir. Okay, okay. God bless you, David. God bless you too, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you were encouraged by today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. For more uplifting and thought-provoking content, please visit us online at servantsofgrace.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Servants of Grace and on Facebook at facebook.com slash servantsofgrace. We hope you have a blessed day and we will see you next time.